Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. During the 2014 American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature Conference in San Diego, we brought together Dr. John Collins and a group of professors to discuss teaching Introduction to the Hebrew Bible. Their full discussion follows in its entirety. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief. I think this will probably work best if you all raise the questions. Uh, how many of you have, in fact, taught Old Testament or Hebrew Bible? Just about everyone. How many of you have actually used this textbook in any of its incarnations? Okay. Wait. There's a little growth area there. Just a short introduction. I actually read the first edition when it first came out, and all of the typos are circled. I just never got You should have, you know, <laughs> it occurred to me this morning that it, we really should have had this session two years ago before I did the revision. <laughs> it would have been a lot more, <laughs> more productive. Um, when the, the first uh, edition came out, one of the people who reviewed it was Thomas Romer. And um, he said, you know, this actually would work best for people who didn't know anything about the subject. To which I said, duh. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't think Thomas, you know, could conceive of teaching it to some pe people who didn't know anything about the subject. <laughs> but, but that is absolutely what this is for. <laughs> And, you know, my own, uh, I've been teaching uh, for a little over 40 years. Uh, I've taught, I've been teaching, you know, this is most directly based on the way I teach it at Yale. But I was doing the same thing before that at Chicago, at Notre Dame with undergraduates, at DePaul with undergraduates, you know, various at the Catholic Seminary in Chicago before that. I have never seen much difference in what I needed to do depending on whether they're seminarians, master's students, or undergraduates. Uh, with, at a place like Yale, you will get people in the class who do know something about it coming in, but you'll always have a fair number of people in the class who don't. One of the educational moments in my career was when I started teaching in Chicago, I was just trying to warm up the class, you know, before and I said, okay, who came first, Abraham or Moses? Moses. This was a universalist, <laughs> a Unitarian, uh, who, who had read, never read the Bible at all. <laughs> uh, so there was a visiting Israeli scholar uh, who said, uh, I met a pagan. <laughs> you know. So, you know, you don't you try to assume as little as possible. So, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and I think, you know, with any of these, some of them may be going on to do PhD work. If they do, they will deal with everything that's raised here in much more detail, and it will all turn out to be much more complicated. So, be it, you don't try to do that straight off. Uh, now, my approach is unabashedly and unapologetically historical critical. That is to say, what I want to communicate to people is that this wasn't written to address our personal problems. It wasn't, it's written a long time ago and in another culture. Now, you need to have some sense of that. Furthermore, this is not divine oracles just dropped from heaven. What you have in here is always written by human beings in a particular context. At the end of my course, I come around to talking about things like inspiration and revelation, but I always insist on not talking about those up front because usually they just bring uh, wrong assumptions. I think for a lot of people who have not had exposure to any kind of critical study of the Bible before, they expect it to be historically true, morally edifying, and internally consistent. And while, you know, bits of it would satisfy that, none of those things hold. And what I also try to get across to them is, and it's none the worse for that. 
you know, there are other ways of teaching people besides telling them accurate facts. And there are, um, you know, other ways of teaching besides giving people edifying examples. Sometimes you learn more about morality from the unedifying examples. And so, you know, this is the, the general framework of what I am trying to do. What are they going to take away from it? I learned long time ago that no matter how many quizzes you give people, a year later none of them are going to remember the names of the kings of Israel. <laughs> or the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, daughters of Job. <laughs> uh, so, you, know, you still have to make them learn a certain amount of that. But that's not what's going to stick in the long run. Equally, they need to have some sense of how the Bible grew as a literary work. Uh, there is a limit to how much of that they will retain. I think one of the attractions of the old JEDP hypothesis is that when it's done properly, I think it leaves people with a readable text. With all due respect to some of our European colleagues and David Carr, uh, the, uh, if a lot of the, the, the you know, a lot of Europeans say it's all what they call Fortschreibung. In other words, you have a nucleus and then people add a verse here, a verse there. Well, that, even if that's true, you can't, if beginning students can't read the text that way. You've got to read coherent units in it some way or other. And so I think, um, as I say, I'm not necessarily here trying to give people the cutting edge of where the debate on the formation of the Pentateuch is. They ought to know that there are these different approaches and they ought to have a general idea about it. But really, the, the main point I'm trying to get across is that this is written by real live people in real live situations. Now, you know, I have often come across the objection that this is imprisoning the Bible in the past. I've never heard that from a student who took my course. And I've never felt that it imprisoned it in anything. To my mind, the way you make this come alive is by analogy. Human nature hasn't changed that much. And, you know, take some of those stories and judges. Uh, you can find modern analogies. You know, I, I love to do Jotham's fable after an election. Uh, <coughs> who wants to be king? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't think that that's any problem at all. Whereas I had a great problem always with the kind of canonical approach that Brevara Giles, my esteemed predecessor, took, which seemed to me to be awfully abstract and formalistic when you get down to it, and not nearly as usable, say, for people who need to go out and preach on it. Now, uh, another thing then that I try to focus on, without being too heavy-handed about it, I hope, is the, the ethical implications. Uh, because for, certainly for my students, but I think for anybody who, who has an existential interest in the book, this is something they're going to go out and use. And so, you know, you need to discuss what exactly does the Hebrew Bible say about homosexuality, for example. How often does it come up? Strictly speaking, two verses, but, uh, uh, but you know, you just got to get the facts right, I think, on some of that. And you're, but I think those are issues that have to be raised. And in some cases, the Bible is not going to be as clear-cut as people expected it to be. Uh, but I think, you know, I would feel that I hadn't especially succeeded in a course if I hadn't made people think about that kind of thing. What do uh, people, what issues do people have when they come in? Now, you still get people who are shocked at the idea that the walls of Jericho may not have fallen in the manner described. But actually, you know, when they get 
get exposed to it, that isn't so hard. I think the much harder issues to deal with in the Hebrew Bible are like a divine command to slaughter the Canaanites. Whether it ever happened or not isn't the issue. You know, it's the, the moral ideals that are proposed. And you know, the, the line I take on that is that uh, I tell them the Bible itself is to some degree a running argument and that they ought to have a running argument with it. That the purpose of it is to make you think. It's not to give you simple prescribed answers. So, you know, to proceed with that, you need to have some appreciation of literary genre. You have to realize that there are different literary genres. This isn't a newspaper. Uh, you have to, to have some sense of other literature of the ancient Near East. And I think you know, a lot of the, the art of doing an introductory course is to, to learn you know, how to give them enough of that without smothering them, without giving them too much. That's generally something you get the feel of as you go along and, uh, and from feedback. Um, a couple of other issues, let's see. Uh, you know, one of the issues that I had to face when I was starting to write this is uh, how do you organize it? Because you know, there are always, I think, two poles that we have to negotiate. On the one hand, there is the canonical text. On the other hand, there is the history. You have to have a bit of both. Now, there have been histories, uh, no, and I don't think you can, it works, to, to do the history first and then the text. I guess Norman Gottwald got away with doing that for a long time. I never, I, I always had trouble with it in class because I figure, now, even we have two semesters on this at jail, that's the most luxury I've ever had. I've done this all in 10 weeks too in Chicago. Anything that's worth doing can be done in whatever time is available. You just need to be selective in how you do it. But even if you have a whole year to do it, you don't have time to go over the same material twice. And so you've got to find a way to go through it once. And uh, now, you know, I've, my solution to this, I am quite happy with. I find it works in practice. It doesn't work as well in theory. Uh, that is that I start out with the canonical Pentateuch because it gives you, you know, what is presented as the foundational story. And, but when I get to the prophets, I do those in historical order rather than in canonical. I have a colleague who actually does Daniel before she does Amos. And I can't see how that can breed anything but confusion. Because, I, now, on the other hand, you know, even though Deuteronomy is presumably later than some of the prophets, uh, I think it's more coherent to do that in the first pass through. But at least, you know, even if I'm hopping around within the prophets, that's only within the prophets, and I do do the large blocks in canonical sequence. Uh, maybe that is enough to just get us started, and uh, maybe somebody has a question that can further the discussion a little bit at this point. I mean, have any of you encountered any particular problems in teaching or taking a course on the, uh, an introductory course? Now, I know a couple of you are doing pre-college I would hope that at least the short version would work. It it's, works. Yep. And I'm teaching, believe it or not, 14 to 15 year old boys. Okay. Yeah. And they get it. But I start off with the narrative of Abraham. I don't, I yeah. skip <clears throat> the creation story. I go to Joseph, and in the Joseph story, we see a problem, how he got to Egypt. And we start, then I teach them source theory, 
and they have cards, they're color coding their Bibles, they're see seeing the weaving going through, and then I go back and do the creation story so that you can see the two and the two Noah stuff, and they can start to see. But you, I have them for a year, and I'm going to break their hearts in the beginning by telling them that what truth is isn't what they understand truth to be, and that they're now at another level of learning, and they're you know, going to be able to understand on yeah. a different level, and then it clicks about three months in after you. Then I go back and I continue the story mm -hmm. after Joseph, and then they can see the J and the E kind of, because they, they color code all of Genesis, so they start to see these two traditions. And they see yeah. um, on the timeline that every source has a different perspective because they're writing at a different time, they have a different relationship with God, and that you know you want them to see. So that's, and they get it, and they get it. And so it's really exciting. I must say that this is something that my teacher taught me, and her name was Donna Wanland, and she was a member and came here for 40, 30 some years. I don't know if any of you remember old enough. I used to push her around in a wheelchair <laughs> for years here. But, yeah. but she was a brilliant woman. Claremont School of Theology, one of the first women there. And she decided to teach yeah. at the high school level anyway. I it, it works. Well, I also teach for colleagues, and at our level, at the high school level, the bishops have mandated this curriculum. <sighs> Scope and sequences is how you teach it, and it's very, very interesting because it's scriptural studies the way you present it, which is how we both teach it, is not even part of the core curriculum. It's an, yeah. it, it's an elective. And it just boggles our mind that, you know, we're already at this higher level, and I mean, this seems to be proper theology, and they just move completely away from that. So you might get students coming into your classrooms who really have less of a foundation now, because they're mandating that we are not to really teach it this way, or even teach this I know, at all. You know, I, I mean, I find this kind of thing almost heartbreaking. Uh, you know, the, the <laughs> bibli critical biblical scholarship has been going on for, for 200 years. And it's hardly made a dent in the churches. And the, the problem is that people who, say, who sit in my class at jail and absorb it all, then go out and relapse mm -hmm. and tell people what they figure people want to hear. Mm -hmm. And their main concern becomes not to upset them. Yeah. And th this is awfully counterproductive because I think, you know, if your goal is, and I do have kind of in the background here, though that this isn't a book about biblical theology, but my, that, that is kind of a goal in the background. And I think this is a much more uh, active way to engage the text. You know, that a, a good biblical theology is, is, is not something that gives you a list of things you can safely believe at the end of it, but it gives you issues and gives, stimulates you to think through them. Mm -hmm. And I think people who get into that really interact with the biblical text on a much deeper level. And I don't see why that should be, be any problem for, uh, for anybody. Well, maybe I do, but yeah. Uh, Ken, and then we'll work down the table there. Yeah, yeah no, just one practical thing. One, um, we, we, we have a core curriculum class on the whole Bible. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, but I find that I do probably two thirds of it in the Hebrew Bible because I find my students don't know anything about the Hebrew Bible. They know a little bit about the New Testament, but not the Hebrew Bible. I've used, I first of all used your large one, but I found it too large for that kind of course, and I went on to the short one. But then using the short one, I found myself going by myself to the large one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah. yes, it is a challenge, but and, you know, dealing with undergraduates mainly from the, the Bible South, it's a particular challenge to help them to open up uh, to new ways of thinking. Yeah. But I found that but, both books very useful, very helpful. Yeah. That's good, you know, I mean, that, that's, um, if I get some students from the Bible South, mm -hmm. but they're always in a minority. And I think uh, it's a whole different thing if they're in the majority. Yeah. And I hear this from some of my own students who are out teaching. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I could take pointers on that probably. 
but go ahead. Uh, yeah. <coughs> I'm just wondering if you have any particular insights on how to integrate the wisdom uh, writings into uh, the overall course and how you, whether you have any particular insights on how to teach those as part of the survey. Well, you know, I have never... I ought, First of all, I always include them. When I do the second half at jail, and even, you know, when I've done the whole Old Testament in ten weeks... I'd always make sure to get in things like the Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, I always remind the Protestants in the class that they get shortchanged in their Bible. They don't get the whole thing. <laughs> but I've never had uh, seen any great um, problem in the transition. Now, back, you know, when I was in school myself, the emphasis was much more heavily historical. I said, this emphasis is historically critical, but it's not teaching people history in the way that, say, George Ernest Wright or Bernard Anderson used to do it. And I think for them, it was much more of an oddity when you hit the wisdom literature. But if you are used to picking up Deuteronomy, you know, and scrutinizing some of the laws and saying, asking students, though, what do you think of this? Say so some, some of the, the laws about uh, rape or, um, uh, you know, irregular sexual relations. And, you know, you toss this around in class and get a few different takes on it. When you move to Proverbs and Kohelet, it's not that different. Actually, that there is, is great continuity, I think, between the laws and maybe especially in Deuteronomy and the wisdom books. And, you know, even with the prophets, uh, now a lot of the stuff of the prophets is about theodicy, one way or the other. Now, Job, I think, is just a great book to end with. You know, because... <laughs> Uh, it takes everything you've learned in the course up to this point and puts it in question. You know, I, as I read Job, the friends of Job, for all practical purposes, they, they were trained on Proverbs and Deuteronomy. <laughs> That's where they're coming out of. And then here comes Job and says, come on, this doesn't work. This isn't what I'm experiencing. And, you know, my, less, my message to the students isn't that, and Job is right, but, you know, weigh this. Try this out on both sides. Because it's, it's like a running argument, as I say. And Job is great for a running argument. So is Kohelet. There is a time for this and a time for that. And I think Kohelet, uh, to my mind, if you want to take one book as a hermeneutical key to the rest of the Hebrew Bible, that's the book I take. You know, I've worked a lot myself on apocalyptic literature, but I have much more kinship with Kohelet, actually, when you, uh, when you get down to it. So, you know, I think that that would be my way of doing it, that, that when you break the stuff down, you know, and ask what kind of question is this material addressing? There's another hand. Yes. yes. Uh, so now having been a former uh, student of yours and having sat in your classes, <laughs> I kind of know, um, I, I can relate to what you're saying now. Now that I'm on the other side teaching undergraduate yeah. students, so it's, uh, I have so many questions. And I just, I'll 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 just, i and, and I really um, appreciated your historical critical approach, uh, which allowed me to understand the context where, where this, uh, this text is coming from. But now the, the other question is, uh, where do, is there room for uh, a history of interpretation, such as the Talmudic or rabbinical, later rabbinical traditions? And, and if so, um, how would you weave it? Or if, if not, um, why would it not be uh, relevant for maybe a place like historical critical approach? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I bring it in incidentally. Okay. 
So, see, if I'm discussing the sacrifice of Isaac, I will quote Immanuel Kant, and I'll quote Kierkegaard. Uh, you know, where, where you have issues that have been famously discussed. Uh, I, if you're talking about the faith of Abraham, you've got to mention Paul, you've got to mention the use that, you know, is there an opposition between faith and law, or isn't there, or what? But now that, just as I say, comes in incidentally. I mean, you'll even find a little bit of it scattered through the textbook, but you won't find a separate section on it. Now, uh, beyond that, my, my problem is I don't want to take too much time away from the actual text. Because I think the goal in any introductory course is, first of all, to get them to read the text. And the one caution I would have about the, uh, the history of interpretation approach is that I don't want them to come out of the class thinking, and you can really interpret this any way you like. You know, it used to be interpreted that way, and, and it, it's true. Uh, there's a great book, I think, on the interpretation of the book of Jonah by Yvonne Sherwood, in which she shows that for a long time it was taken as the obvious literal meaning of the book of Jonah that it was about the resurrection. Any modern reader, you know, I mean, okay, it's typological maybe, but, but to say that that was the first meaning of it, you know, a lot depends on what is taken for granted. And actually what was taken for granted when many of us were in school isn't taken for granted anymore. You know, the rise of feminism, for example, has shown us a lot of material in just a very different light from the way we would have taken it for granted. But I don't want people then to come away thinking, and since everything is perspectival, I can have my own perspective and it's as good as any other. So, you know, I want to push them that if you, that you can still argue about things and uh, you've got to make an argument for your perspective. But, you know, I think history of interpretation is a great thing. I think uh, to do it really properly, you probably should do it in history of Christianity courses yeah. or history of Judaism courses. Mm. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, yeah. do you think there's any room for including things like feminist perspectives, new literary readings, and majority world perspectives on uh, the Hebrew Bible? What was the last one? The majority world perspectives. So, from what? Af African and Asian scholars. Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think you can't, you cannot but include a feminist perspective. When, uh, when we teach this now, say I was teaching the first half of this this fall at Yale, and uh, every week we have sections. Now, so I assign sections on feminist interpretation, sociological interpretation, literary interpretation, a la Robert Alter. Now, I don't break those out in the textbook. I think they're all implied one point or another, but you know, I think actually it would be good to have a nice primer of different methods to use as a supplementary textbook. But you cannot but use those. Now, world perspectives, I mean, in principle, yes. In practice, it's a bridge too far. I mean, from my experience. And that may not be your experience. You're in a different place. And some, some of the world, well, there are parts of the world that are closer to you that are more distant from me. <laughs> I, I just think particularly the honor shame culture that's picked up in a lot of uh, other countries is a helpful way into the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. Well, no, that's interesting. Yeah, but I, I, haven't, I haven't really gone there. We get a lot of Korean students, for example, and um, you know I think it would be helpful for them to have Asian perspectives on the Bible, but I want them to learn this first. Uh, because also, you know, you've got to give them a foundation to start with. 
but I think it should belong somewhere in the curriculum, all right. Yes, James. Uh, in, your, uh, in your course at Yale, you just are doing uh, a 10-week course, and you do the entire Hebrew Bible, is that correct? No. Uh, it's a 12-week course, and I do the first half. First half, okay. Uh, so presumably... But I could do the whole thing, it, if it were put up to me. What is the... <laughs> <laughs> you just pick different stepping stones. One might, would yeah. presume that you require your text. How much of the Hebrew Bible do they have to read? Well, you know, in principle, they read nearly all of it. Okay. They're supposed to. <laughs> Do I actually check to see how much of it they read? No. I mean, when it comes to exams, I'm going to examine them and the things I hit in class mm -hmm. or that were covered in the sections. But now some of them will indeed get into it. In fact, I had one student who was dropping in on the class. You know, that I hadn't... I hadn't met her at the beginning of the semester that I noticed she was there. And so I went and talked to her. And um, she said, oh, I'm not doing this for credit at all. I think of this as story time. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I chose to take that as a compliment. <laughs> One could have taken it otherwise, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I mean, really, the, the goal of the exercise is to get them to read it. And, you know, people who have strong views of what's in the Bible very often haven't read actually it. read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I learned that a long time ago. Uh, when I taught at DePaul University in Chicago, I had a basketball player named Terry Cummings, who was a, was a great guy, he was a really nice guy. He had said publicly that he chose to go to DePaul so that he could take classes in Bible. And everybody was afraid he would go and take a class in Bible and found what it was like <laughs> and get out of there fast. But he said to me one day, man, can't I just say it my way? You see, what he had learned a patois of this from, from listening to sermons he didn't have a clue what was actually in the text when it got down to it. You know, he was a good-natured guy, and he tried, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's what you're up against. Jack. I actually want to follow up on yeah. that, because one of the hardest things, I stay away from textbooks as a teacher, because students study the textbooks and not the text. So I, I want to actually push you on that past the sense of humor. How do you write a text that actually, how do you hold them accountable to the text, not the textbook? Because it's one of my chief reasons for avoiding textbooks. Yeah, no, I think, it, in fact, you know, you need a textbook. I mean, the students need a textbook. Because if they just sit down to read the Bible, now they may become fascinated by it. But I find a lot of them become, would become very confused. And I have known students you know, in class, uh, back even before I wrote this, you know, who would come looking for help on that. How do you hold them accountable to the text? Well, you know, you, you ask in your exams, you ask very text-based questions. Uh, for the final, I always throw in, what book does this come from? <laughs> and, no, I mean, it's not going to be the obscure things, but, um, you know, and so-and-so and -so did what was evil in the Lord more than all who went before him. You know, if you don't know where that's from, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can do little things like that. Um, and, of course, in class... What I do, I mean, I've, this has been the butt of much comedy over the years because I go in with a cup of coffee in the Bible. And, uh, you know, what we're constantly doing is reading texts and discussing them. I don't spend my time in class discussing secondary literature. I may mention it on occasion when I think it helps. But what I do is read a passage and we discuss it. I'm going to circle back. Yep. If you'll forgive me. There's still, if you ask a question like that, they, if they're smart, they've seen it in the textbook and they've seen it in your lecture, heard it in your lectures. 
and I'm still not sure they're having to read the text. I mean, this was a back at Duke days with Moody Smith's textbook. I mean, they all yeah. read Moody Smith's New Testament, you know, whatever it was, yeah. edition of the New Testament. But they really, it was kind of optional to read the New Testament. So uh, uh, in your years well, of being savvy with them, have you somehow not done their homework with a good textbook? Yeah, have you not done their work for them by providing them a really good textbook? Well, uh, you know, I would actually hope I have done some of their homework for them by providing them with a really good textbook, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Because there's a limit to how much they're going to do anyway. <laughs> now, if you really want to push them on that, what you do is, in your exams, you ask the things you didn't talk about in class. Mm. Try it. <laughs> let me know. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> but I mean, that, that I think it would is what. Nice to keep that's track that's of what those you would do. Questions that were not covered in text yeah. or lecture, and and compare the percentage that got it right with the percentage that got it right, and, and actually have a teaching assistant do that. Here are the five yes. questions that did not get covered in the text or the lecture. How they do, and maybe yeah. see. But, but my, my guess is that you'd be, have a fair deal of pandemonium mm -hmm. and panic <laughs> coming up to the class. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I've also learned in teaching introductory classes, even at Yale Divinity School, say, is those poor kids are anxious. <laughs> you know, you, you, it's, it's, you need a kind of therapy to get them through it half the time. <laughs> so increasing their level of anxiety doesn't seem to me to be a good pedagogical technique. <laughs> I once did a review session with Jeopardy back at Duke Day. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it completely backfired. It just made them all work. They only yeah. saw all the ones that had little dollars. And, and, and you know, all I saw is what they it, didn't know. It worries me. I mean, it amazes me what they're worried about because it's not like they're looking for their place in their class in law school. You know, their, their future income isn't going to depend on this, but they worry about it. Yeah, and good for them. Neil. <laughs> I, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit. It seems to me that, um, at least for the students I've had in undergraduate state universities, there is a tremendous group, not just people who know about the Bible, people who don't know, but people who think they know about the Bible coming into oh, yeah. class. And the kind of disabusing them of that is a major part of what the class inevitably involves, mm -hmm. which can lead to a lot of anxiety and confusion. But it seems to me that, that a focus, if we make it an absolute value, just get them into the text without any kind of apparatus around that, it's not just that it confuses them, but it reinscribes this notion that the Bible is completely self-contained and speaks its own mind, yeah, yeah. and we just have yeah. to sit back and, and pay attention. It seems to me an intelligent guide, even if I never get near the wisdom literature in this semester, an intelligent guide to the wisdom literature will help them in the future to know where, where to go with it. Yeah. Um, one reaction after I started, what I was the editor at Fortress Press when we first abridged um, the large yep. part of the smaller one. And I think I was the first adopter at Metro State and St. Paul of that textbook. And the, the impression I got as we went along, one of about two weeks in, that the students are very keen to know who is this guy who is disagreeing with what we learned about the Bible. <laughs> who does he think he is? My students say you're the story spoiler. They also want to hear the same way that their preacher had told them it's like this. They want to know what's your authority for this and how do you prove it. And your textbook doesn't try to prove this is the date of the Yahwist, we're done. Your textbook says here are the reasons we think about the Yahwist in this way. So at the end of the semester, people weren't really sure exactly what to make of it all, but they had a real clear orientation to how to think through the questions. Mm -hmm. What kinds of questions matter as we look at this? And I, I that, very much so appreciated that. Let me take the opportunity, by the way, to say that probably the biggest improvement in the new edition is the illustrations. And these are almost entirely the work of Neil Elliott. So <laughs> let, me, let me take the opportunity to thank you for that. Just, uh, for all the work you did on it. Yes? One, uh, one 
problem that I have is teaching at a faith-based institution where Bible classes are required. If some students that are you know, here, not for this program, uh, yeah. but th this is a required course, no uh, interest or knowledge of uh, yeah. the topic, and then uh, we're Christian institutions, so Christian uh, students that um, think they know what this means, mm -hmm. uh, or think they understand how to read it. So we've got kind of signals crossing the nights, uh, students that uh, don't know anything about it and are aware of that, students that uh, might think they do but, but really don't, and, and trying to meet both of these yeah. students at a common ground. Have you, uh, like, now, you know, I mean, I've taught at Catholic <laughs> institutions, which are in a manner of speaking faith-based, but not quite <laughs> in the same manner of speaking as what you're up against, yeah. I think. Uh, the, the thought that comes to my mind, um, if I were in your situation, without it being my own book at all, is to say, look, there's a lot of the world out there that looks at this material differently. Here is something to help you understand how other people see it. And think about it. Can you learn anything from this? Is this really inimical to what you hold to be a value? I would hope that they would find that if they think about it long enough, it isn't really. I mean, this is not a hostile book. Uh, I'm sure there are people out there who would feel that this is a hostile book, something tearing down what they believed in, but that isn't the, the purpose of it at all, actually. You know, we're really all concerned about the same material. And I think uh, what I would hope to achieve in doing that in a faith-based institution is to help people understand that reasonable people and people of goodwill can think about this material in somewhat different ways. And it doesn't mean that they're out to get you. It doesn't mean that they're trying to tear things down. You know, that it's all a quest for understanding, actually. Yeah. I, I have used that approach. Uh, yeah. I don't currently use your textbook, but I, I did use it for about a decade. And, but I have used that approach that I said, this, and I still believe this is true, this is about the best summary I know of, of where the academy is mm -hmm. in the 21st century right now and where the arguments are. And I don't think he's always right, but I think it's an excellent summary of where the academy is. And you ought to know that, whether you agree with it or not. But it is curious that, especially when it first came out, I would get, and I never understood it, I would get from students, why is he so angry? Why is he, why is he, so, disrespect, why is he so disrespectful? And I didn't get that at all, but... No, I must say, I didn't think maybe, I was. I didn't, maybe, maybe it was just so different from what, what they know. had been taught. But. Yeah, and you know, I mean, frankly, too, that some of this comes from the fact that I'm Catholic by upbringing and well, training. Well, I would tell them that. And, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I wasn't raised with the kind of attachment to the Bible that some of your students were. But, you know, tell them I'm actually reasonably calm most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, the story spoiling isn't even a reflection of anger or not. You really just think you give away the endings before they had a chance to get them. Oh, the you okay. I didn't, after I didn't you read catch the primary that. Yeah. stories. It's um, my issue, which I'm sure is another one that others at the table have encountered as well, is that even if the students are willing to grant aspects of a historical critical contextualization of these texts, um, they always kind of find a way to default to some prior kind of theological expectation yeah. of the text. Like, well, isn't it possible that actually Jacob was wrestling with Christ? Or isn't it possible that Christ was the one that gave the laws? And You know, they kind of keep coming back to this stuff. And, you know, aside from saying, no, it's actually not at all possible, or something like that, and taking this very hard-line position that I you know, tend not to yeah. adopt with them in the interest of trying to kind of say this is the historical critical method, this is how yeah. scholars in the field you know, would approach this material or something like that. It is kind of difficult to 
get them thinking outside of you know that that tendency to just read back Christian expectations into the Hebrew Bible literature. Yeah. Now you know one of the first things, one of the things I always emphasize at the beginning and at the end of the course, is that this isn't about what is possible. Mm-hmm. All manner of things are possible. Okay. Maybe we're reading the Hebrew upside down, for God's sake. <laughs> but, but, but it's not very probable. And what, what it's really about is degrees of probability. Okay. And so if you're talking about Jacob, is it more probable and plausible that this was written in a way that people of the time could conceivably understand? And there's no way that anybody in a whatever pick a date, yeah. uh, B.C., could have thought that this was a matter of wrestling with Christ. Yes. Now, you can say, all right, Christians could come along and read it that way. But that's very much a secondary adaptation of the story. And we try and uh, do that, and I think it's effective to a certain point to kind of yeah. demonstrate a shift. I'll bring in Paul yeah. there and say, look, yeah. this very specific yeah. and innovative way that Paul is reading the story of Abraham, or yeah. you know, here are these different lenses that we start to see being applied to these texts. Um, but it is hard, because ultimately there is that kind of default position that, I, I, again, I don't want to you know, just insist. <laughs> no. Or something like that, it, it's... It, re- it reminds me of one time I was giving a talk to church in Milwaukee. Oh, this is more than 30 years ago. And at the end of it, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I wish the bishop were here so I could know how much of this I could believe. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, you had to throw up your hands. <laughs> Neil, you had something else? <laughs> uh, to your comment earlier about um, it, it's important for students to know if they come from a particular... Christian background, that there's a world of, of people out there who see things differently, and that people, the way you put it, reasonable people of goodwill may read otherwise. I've found in recenter years that I'm more willing to say it's also important to note that reasonable Christians of goodwill mm-hmm. read it this way. So it's not just a matter of you know, Christians all thinking alike and then yeah. a great pagan unwashed <laughs> out there thinking like you do, but to say, you know, there's, there's a breadth of this. I um, was teaching one course where four or five weeks in, I was, one student again and again was saying, well, this is just carnal thinking, just carnal thinking. <laughs> in her church, there's spiritual thinking and carnal thinking. Uh, yeah. And it didn't change until I mentioned having just come from a funeral as the officiant, as a, as a priest, and suddenly, oh, I was a pastor, and it became okay to think about this. Mm-hmm. It didn't fix things. It, it still confused them a lot. But the idea that, well, there's the Christian way and whatever's going on in class, that suddenly got really messy. So I, I started saying, yeah. Christians think this way. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. 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 Right. Any other? If maybe one more. If, if. Jack. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions. He has a lot of questions. Do you need to ask a question? <laughs> 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 we do another group coming in at 11, so... Okay, with the, the question only lasts six yeah, or wait, seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> 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 now, in my experience, now, the question is, um, years ago I used Fun Rod. And yeah, I love so Fun Rod because he's passionate about these lonely people who were prophets and... I found students resonated yeah. with the with sort of the existential reality of being an isolated prophet in a world that didn't understand them. Um, explain to me why your textbook would be better than using Van Rad. Well, let me say why I stopped using Van Rad because I also liked it, uh, but Van Rad was operating with an assumption that you have the covenant at the start, the, the covenant, okay. and the prophets are all interpreting that. They're within that framework. This, I think, is not a tenable position anymore. I think uh, that, you know, whatever you think of Wellhausen in other respects, he was basically right on that, that the, the, the covenant really you get in its full form in Deuteronomy. It's more near the end of the prophetic period. And it is in large part due to the preaching of the prophets. If you're dealing with somebody like Amos or Hosea, they do not, they're not referring to a normative tradition. 
that way. They're referring to a kind of basic insight into what is justice, what is right. And I think that's quite different orientation to the material. One last thing that I should say is there is no reason why an introduction to the Old Testament should not be a very enjoyable course for everybody. <laughs> you know, it's great material, and anybody who, who teaches it in a way that it isn't enjoyable is doing it a real disservice. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening in on the discussion with Dr. Collins. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 019. Fortress Press Live is available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube. So be sure to subscribe using your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.